thank you very much, Mary. You sound so sexy right now. <laughs> and thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with the luminous Howardina Pindell. Howardina has been working for decades, decades as an artist, someone who's garnered so much attention and support in the world over that long decades career. And what we're seeing now is an amazing resurgence of her work and attention to her work now. Um, we congratulate her on a sold out booth at the, Gar the Greening Gallery. <laughs> And we also congratulate her on her upcoming uh, survey show that I'm curating with the equally luminous Valerie Cassell Oliver, senior curator at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston. So uh, Howardina has a survey show coming up March 2018 in Chicago, traveling on to Houston afterwards and then into the world. And we thought in advance of that show and while we're here at the fair, we have a conversation kind of reintroducing, for the sake of some folks, uh, Howardina uh, to this audience, and also talking a bit about the concerns of her work and her overall practice as a woman in the world. So we thought we'd start basically from the beginning, maybe not birth, but <laughs> the beginning of an artistic career. You um, got an MFA from Yale in 1967, I believe. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you did going into Yale uh, what you accomplished there, and what came out of it. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I, my training basically was academic painting. I was from Philadelphia. You have Aikens, you have the Pennsylvania Academy, and it was all, you know, mostly working from life. Then I went to Boston University for my BFA, and it was very much even more academy than uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and then I got into Yale, and I'm puzzled, because Yale at that point was abstract expressionism, a kind of minimalism, and a pop art, and hard edge. And that was championed, actually, the hard edge by Al Held. And so here I am, this figurative painter, and in this sea of non-figurative work, and I started to learn a new way of seeing. And very gradually, when I, it came close for graduation, I had been kind of pushed into a kind of abstract expressionism. The skeleton that you saw, I had been going from New Haven to New York for the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam marches. And this is the point where I started to include skeletons in terms of the issue of, of death and war. But I didn't realize it until I looked at the timing of the time that I um, did the skeleton pieces. At Yale, what I learned the most was the use of color. Uh, I liked very much Ad Reinhardt's paintings that were close value color, but the key thing was Joseph Albers' course in um, The Homage to the Square, which is a book. And at that point, he had had an argument with Yale, and he left. So we were taught, that is, at that point, it was the School of Art and Architecture. The architects and the uh, painters, sculptors, photographers, whatever, we all took the course together, which was Albert's course, but taught by his protege. And that is why I like playing with color, because he taught us that color is relative. And anything you put next to a color will change that color optically for you, even if we each see color just a slight, slightly different. But as you work and you surround a color, it can become something else. And we had you know, different things we had to do to practice that. Well, you arrived at Yale as a figurative painter and emerged mm -hmm. as an abstract I painter. I would say as a, mm, it was like a kind of abstract expressionist figuration, I'll put it that way. And then once I started working, at this point I worked at a museum, um, it was the modern, and I was surrounded by just all kinds of work. It was like being a librarian in the biggest library in the world. It was, I just, I really appreciate being able to see the work that I saw, especially on days when those public were not allowed, I could wander around and see uh, and actually, in retrospect, I was very influenced by Kandinsky. Mm. Yeah, odd, very odd. 
anyway, the time that I spent in the museum I thought was very fruitful because not only the appreciation of the art, but also it put me in a position to have an inside view of the art world, which meant that there were certain things that I thought were unfair, but I could prove it rather than having a feeling that this is happening or that is happening. I was able to see things and name them. Hence, I eventually started writing about them and I did a statistical survey mm -hmm. also in terms of people of color in museums and galleries using Art in America where the dealers would say who they were showing. They couldn't say that I made it up. It's right there in print. So I just became kind of at a, at a point where I had to say something. Well, you, you, and the activism is a very important part of the work, but I want to go back to things about process and about mm -hmm. creating a sort of language that you use, beginning at Yale, mm -hmm. where you began to look at these very formalist tendencies in painting, mm -hmm. but then you're disrupting these formalist tendencies, mm -hmm. being, first of all, the number of black people at Yale studying at that time, mm -hmm. and the number of women studying yeah. at Yale at that time. Yeah, there so. were no other women um, at Yale except the graduate courses, the people getting their MFAs or MAs or PhDs. And it wasn't until a few years after that that they actually integrated the program and included women. So there was always this sort of snide thing that would happen where um, a professor would say, um, hello, lady and gentlemen. So you would get these sort of snide, but it wasn't meant really as hostility, yeah. just simply, it was a fact. <laughs> and how many people of color were at Yale at the time? I can only remember three, but I'm sure there were others in graduate departments where our paths wouldn't cross. Um, I remember there was a lawyer, though, he was Aborigine from Australia, and there was someone I grew up with was a, who was in the law school. I would say there were three men, and I maybe five of us. Yeah, maybe five of us. Um, the town itself was hardly a town. I mean, I didn't feel any kind of um, racial, racial animosity when I was in town. Um, and the Yale students who were like these really, the legacy students whose parents went there, and I remember there was one with a gold cane, um, would make fun, you know, of the... Um, people who were local and would call them townies, which I thought was really, you know, kind of very unfair. Uh, but anyway, my time there made a difference because I was able to combine later two languages, that of abstraction and figuration as well as um, photography. I, I got a very good education combining both Boston and Yale. And Boston's where you went for undergrad. That's where I went for undergraduate. They had a BFA. They also had an MFA program. Um, but the, the BFA is what I, I, let's see now, I entered in 1961, graduated in 65, and then I graduated from Yale in 67. Well, the earlier paintings, which are so process-oriented, do you want to talk a little bit about I think there are some images that will circul mm -hmm. circulate around again, but... Well, um, oh, it's so hard. It, for some reason, and I don't know how I got involved with using a kind of airbrush technique, I was very interested in working, because I was basically an oil painter, and I was doing things like cooking lead whites with linseed oil, which meant I was inhaling arsenic fumes. So... <laughs> I changed to acrylic because I was literally killing myself with the oil. And with the acrylic, I, could, I had much more flexibility with the way I worked because it would dry and I could paint over something and start again. Um, working with the raw canvas, I find that interesting because I'm trying to figure, what, figure out what triggered that because oil, you always have to gesso your canvas, but not with, a, not with acrylic. And I had like this strange put down, and I wonder, I wonder if it came out of that, my interest in acrylic, um, almost like a kind of vengeance. Um, Helen Frankenthaler came through the studios at Yale. They always had a, just a host of visitors to see our work. 
And she came to my studio. Again, I was figurative oil paint at that point. And she just stepped into the studio, stepped back and said, ugh, that was done in the Renaissance. I'm not interested in this. And she walked away. So I got kind of interested in, well, what does she do? <laughs> anyway, so I would run into sometimes this quirky experience. And just a side note that's sort of funny, when I worked at The Modern, I was assigned to work with the Whitney on a show of Helen Frankenthaler. And so I was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was sent to meet her, and she nearly fainted. <laughs> she nearly fainted. Anyway, she got over it. And the only thing that we really had in common is we both hated flying. She did not like to fly. I hate flying. <laughs> Anyhow. Well... I'm interested in this move from oil to acrylic seemed to be about a couple of things. Um, as you say, it's about how you work with a canvas, how you don't have to prime it. But you started doing these really early experimentations, especially right after grad school, where you're layering these kind of um, dot templates over and over again that almost speaks to the screen printing process. Well, I actually... The only screen printing I've done has been done by a master printer. I have never done any screen printing. And I really can't remember why I started using an, in quotes, airbrush technique on raw canvas. Mm -hmm. But it could only be done with something called a water tension breaker, which would thin your paint so it would go through the nozzle, it wouldn't stick. And uh, also because it dried so quickly, the... Um, I think the good thing about it is, and, and when I see the paintings in, in the uh, booth, uh, in Garth Grennan's booth, I'm amazed. Acrylic has kept its color. It yes. has not changed. And with oil, you can get changes. I have a painting I did that was perfectly horrible um, as a teenager. And I would try to do landscape. I've never been that good with landscape. And the reds all turned brown. And also, if you put any kind of varnish over an oil painting, that also will darken it. Now, that's not true uh, with acrylic. Um, acrylic has a kind of versatility, you know, that I prefer. And also, I'm not going to be cooking up a batch of medium out of lead white and linseed oil. I don't need to do that. Um, one of the best places to, uh, or companies, um, that help artists um, with any kind of technical problems with acrylic is the golden. Golden art acrylics are like the top of the food chain. And you can call them up and tell them, okay, I need to do this, how do I do that? They might even develop something as part of their line out of your questions. And they're very, very helpful and they send you bo a box of samples which is always helpful. It's always super exciting. Yeah. But if we get back to the early paintings and thinking about disrupting this idea of minimalist, hard edge painting, which was what was being taught at Yale, mm -hmm. and how you sought to undermine a sort mm -hmm. of hyper male sensibility of that. Um, you were talking about earlier weaving the canvases and mm -hmm. You know, it, at making actions upon them and, and suturing well, them together in ways. Well, it, it's odd um, because I was dealing with the grid, but was on paper. But this was like pulling the grid off of the paper and making it on canvas mm -hmm. by simply, um, you know, just drawing the grid and then cutting it out or drawing just, you know, lines and cutting it out. But snipping off a little bit on either side so that you could see the wall um, behind it. Um, I basically worked off the canvas, in other words, off the wall, I should say. How can I, let me say it a better way. Off the stretcher, that's what I'm trying to yes. say. Yes. I basically worked off the stretcher, and some of them I used a stretcher for. Mm -hmm. um, now, off the stretcher, I think, was a reaction to not having a space big enough to accommodate and I was using folding stretchers also, but they take up space. Right. Uh, and I only had a loft that was big enough for about 10 years. And um, things were in storage um, in where I live now, uh, thanks to uh, the gallery, thanks to Garth. 
uh, I have a proper storage. Um, but I'm still, I'm thrilled that the pieces look so fresh because I, I just, you know, they, you never know. You know. Well, they also still look shocking in many ways because, I mean, I'm a trained art historian. Mm -hmm. However, I think of a painting, I'm thinking of pigment on canvas. Mm -hmm. And what you've been offering, I think, in your career are things like hole punches, yeah. um, along with paint, mm -hmm. but also powder, glitter, mm -hmm. perfume. I mean, how did you start innovating these kind of unusual materials onto the canvas? Well, I think part of it was the influence of the women's movement. When I first started working at the museum, uh, the first curator I was assigned to, who was like a visiting curator, was Lucy Lepard. And so she opened the door for me to, uh, which was basically the white feminist movement. And um, I saw, by way of that, I already became more aware of abstract work and also the use of unusual materials and I remember one of the things at Yale they would say to us is you can't use pink if pink. 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 Okay. Oh, okay if you were a woman they'd say well the pink but if you're a man and you mix white and red and it was pink they would say red and white so I decided I might do some pink Paintings. I mean, I was just basically rebellious in, in a sense that I wasn't towing the line. And one of the first artists that I met, but indirectly, was Eva Hesse at her opening. I think it was at Cooper Union. And I loved the patina of her work, you know, that kind of powdery, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm so, so sorry that she probably passed away because of her materials. That's one thing all artists should be aware of. Please, please look for books about hazards for artists. You need good ventilation, and you may even need some kind of a fume mask. Not just a dust mask, but a fume mask. Yeah, because you'll be working with these materials for years. Um, I became allergic to oil, and my hands would swell. So I can't. No, I just can't use it. I can teach it, but I can't live with it. Do you want to talk now a bit about your works on paper? We alluded to these unusual materials mm -hmm. and uh, this template of using the hole cutouts or the hole punches. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. Well, um, now you can go to a store called Michael's and you can buy <laughs> hole punches. <laughs> and they're big. You know, I have hole punches that are like that and bigger holes. What I do is I draw... Uh, I make drawings and then I punch them out and then I will even position them one by one by using jade glue and I let, put the jade glue down, a little drop of it, it's archival, the glue, and then I use archival paper and I just wait a little bit for the glue to dry, then I stand the oval in the glue and I wait to hold still and I wait and then I let it go and it stays like that. So they went from these very prone pieces to that they're much more sculptural now. Yeah. But, yeah. and I should say that this is a process that you've been working with since the early 1970s yes. to today. And uh, to see the sort of arc of that yeah. has been very interesting. But getting to working with the hole punches, that circular form, and where did it come from? What was the I inspiration? I have no idea. I mean, I try to go back and think, well, what started me punching the holes? Granted, I did the templates and saved the, the dots, uh, but what got me to that point? I have no memory of just, I mean, it might have been something as odd as just buying a hole punch and punching a hole. I mean, just for some reason, I did it, and it felt like this was a, a means of expression that I could really enjoy using. Can I add just one program note? There's a really amazing painting in the Garth Green and Booth from 1973, which is the first one where you produce by making, using this template. So just to explain the template really quickly, Howardina would basically sort of suture together several manila folders. 
and then hole punch across in a kind of, so you get holes in a gridded fa fashion. And that became a template that she would attach to several different parts of the canvas and then put pigment through, yeah, through the, those holes to do these layers and layers of color, shape, and pattern. But um, this 1973 work, which is incredible, is one in which you also add the whole, the whole, the yes. hanging chads yes. as we know them now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was. That was a big turning point. That's what led me to embedding um, the paper in paint. And also I started to separate it out. So I was doing drawings that were three-dimensional, but they weren't drawings. They were, three, I guess they were three-dimensional drawings. And then the paint started to absorb. In other words, um, the first painting with them was on raw canvas. Then the other work was on gessoed canvas, where I would embed, you know, in a thick paint. I love thick paint. Um, I was, uh, I think I was talking earlier about um, how as a child, my parents had art around the house. Uh, my father was a mathematician, a little bit of psychology, but statistics, stuff like that. And my mother was more music and art, but they liked having art around the house. And in a guest room, they had a Van Gogh. And the Van Gogh was of the wheat fields and crows, or one of them. And I remember getting up on the chair and then onto the desk, and it was one of those reproductions that were considered kind of cornball because they were puffy. Yeah. So I would run my hands over the surface of the reproduction. And this was, you know, it's like it clicked. And I, at, yeah, but the thing is, I was doing the spray paintings, which didn't have that. But later I realized the reason why I like the paintings to have a real surface tension with texture was from that experience as a child. Yeah. I don't know whether my mother bought that reproduction or my father bought the reproduction. I don't know. I don't know. Well, you were speaking about your parents and influences. And in the early drawings, there is this propensity to focus on numbers. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that that comes from My father. your father. Yes, he, uh, whenever we travel, he would take out a book, which I called his odometer book or his speedometer book, and he would, t he would plot how many miles, the mileage on the thing that we don't even use anymore, where uh, it tells you how many miles you've gone. Yeah. It, it rotates, mm -hmm. and um, he would just keep books of that. And uh, in fact, at one point, I photographed one. I have no idea where it is in my slide collection. But I saw that. And also, um, he would use me sometimes as a guinea pig. Like, he was also studying uh, intelligence testing. I don't want to oh know. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> he was very interested in statistics, which, again, I used to try to look at the art world. But I don't balance my checkbook very well, so it's not like it helped me, it didn't help me. <laughs> but you also took that number technique into the video drawings, which were, I yes. think, another great innovation yes. of yours. Well, for me, the video drawings were play. Um, the first time I showed them, it just dawned on me after we spoke this morning, was the first showing was the opening of PS1. I was in their inaugural exhibition, and I was in one of the rooms, and that literally was, I think I showed maybe 10 pieces or so. That was the first time. And people were looking at me like, you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. The same thing happened with the punch pieces when I um, punched out the manila and then I wrote on the dots. And I remember the Whitney had a kind of open call for people to bring in their drawings. And they gave mine back to me and said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I just, you know, I thought, you know, that just seems strange to me. So I just, you know, water off the duck's back. I just kept working. It didn't stop me. I wasn't doing it for their approval. And I think that's possibly the difference for artists of color because of basically at the time, and it, it still was true, being shut out of the system, you are driven by your own muse. You're not driven by the market or what other people say because you're not going to read about you know, your work in the press, and I can, whatever, you do it for your own pleasure, 
and you're driven. I mean, just well. Hopefully, that's how all artists should work, and not just hopefully, artists. Hopefully, but some people give, you know, give up. I think one of the things I think about a lot. Some of you may know the artist Joyce Kozlov. She had wanted a Prix de Rome for years. She applied for 26 years, wow. and she got it on year 26. Wow. So whenever I feel discouraged, yeah, no. is that incredible? That's the truth. Tenacity I, pays I, off. I just, yeah. whenever, you know, I think, I never think of stopping because it's just part of my blood, but I just think of her, that she did that. She had the stamina, she had the fortitude, she wasn't pissed off that they didn't, you know, or maybe she was, and that yeah. was part of what drew, drove her. But it was just so rewarding even just to hear uh, what had happened, that she just stuck to it, and she, she got one. Or even Carmen, who's now showing at the Whitney Museum at mm -hmm. 101 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, what? Yeah. yeah. So well, I'll have to look that persistence up. Persistence phase. <laughs> well, it's funny because my father died at 98, so That's good. I have time. You well, do. You yes. Do. <laughs> um, some people may not know in the audience, but in 1979, mm -hmm. you had a massive accident. Um, yeah. And it changed the work, but I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about well, that accident. Okay, I had uh, resigned from the modern. Um, there was this whole thing that happened in March of 79, which had to do with using a um, racial slur as a title from, for oh, an abstract work of art. It was called Nigger Drawings, and it was by a punk white artist, um, and it was shown in one of the public spaces, artist space. So a whole bunch of us got together and we went over to speak to them. It was a, you know, a picket line vir virtually, and they called the police on us. And then we went back again, and again, it was a mixed group, uh, and a, a white woman who was supporting the white woman who was running this space, who had gotten money for outreach to other communities, but she used the money to in, bring in European artists. Um, this young woman actually stood up and said to us, what are you doing down here? How dare you come down and tell us what to do? This is a white neighborhood. So that led to like a lot of fighting verbal stuff in the art world. And I was considered someone who was like Jesse Helms, you know, that I had censored a white artist. Now they weren't looking at the censorship of people of color, the majority in the world. They were not, you know, they didn't mind the censorship of women, you know, all across the board. and. You know, you could just feel that kind of um, disdain in a way that I was, you know, how dare I? So I decided, hmm, um, I'm going to look for a job. And actually, uh, the chairman of the department that I've been with now for 36 years uh, said, we do have a job. Uh, would you like to apply? And I said, sure, you know, and I did, and I got the job. So I um, went to Stony Brook as an associate professor, which meant you had a shorter time to um, be on the tenure you know, track, which was taking a risk, but I did it anyway. And fortunately, University of California, San Diego, offered me tenure at the same time. So I was able you know, um, to get the job. But the accident occurred about a month, month and a half after I joined the faculty, and my chairman, um, Donald Cuspit was driving, but it wasn't his fault. We were in a VW bug. I was in the back, thank God I was turned sideways or I would have broken my pelvis. Um, I still have a dent in my head. You, know, you can see the bald spot. <laughs> Anyhow, and um, we were right outside of school and a woman in a larger car who was on back medication drove into oncoming traffic across the medium strip and hit us. Now, she was apparently an ex-nun, so we would kind of joke about how this was a, an act of God. <laughs> but anyway, it was pretty bad. I mean, I couldn't read a clock, I couldn't read a watch, I couldn't read a newspaper, I couldn't remember, I couldn't face, you know, my face recognition as well as my hearing recognition. I mean, it took time. The reading cleared up, I would say, pretty much within a couple of days. 
but the kind of memory issues, not remembering, you know, it was, it was not pleasant. And I had um, a form of vertigo because it, was, it affected kind of, I guess, the inner ear because I took it on that side. And so I ended up having to use a cane. And of course, I was living in a three floor walk up loft. And of course, I had to bring in groceries and, you know, I'm like this. Uh, but anyway, I got through it. Uh, it made me really more aware of people who have handicaps mm -hmm. that aren't noticeable. Do you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. That that some people may be suffering, but you don't know. That's true. You don't know what they've been through. But it changed the work significantly. Totally. And um, from that point on, you started a series that became very much about stitching memories together because mm. things became quite fragmented. Well, the thing is, I at that point, I believe I started cutting up postcards. I decided that if I should wake up in an ambulance, or if I should not wake up in an ambulance, I have, I have expressed my opinion, my point of view, maybe set up a dialogue, rather than the very, very kind of uh, cool, distant, abstract paintings. Um, and I, I found that if I didn't work, I'd feel worse. Mm. You know, I think because then I'd be sitting about thinking, um, you know, oh my God, this and that. I, I just kept working, even though it was like really, really hard. But the work changed and became autobiographical. And there was an earlier piece I, I spoke about this morning. It was called um, Autobiography, Lake Lilies for Kim. Uh, in 1980, uh, which is the same time I did Free White in 21, I taught at Skelhegan's summer program, and where there was this wonderful student who was kind of hate Ashbury, San Francisco, just a lovely person. So I did a piece about this particular student, splitting postcard images, joining them with paint, driving nails, which was about the accident. Like, I was really upset about the accident. So I would just dip the nails, I kind of, you know, sugar coat it, dip the nails in glitter, and then pound them into the foam core background. And the splitting uh, of the postcards, for me, was like trying to mend my mind, that my consciousness has been split, and this would be how I see the world now, and this is the way the world was. But it's like a slight shift um, I tried to match them perfectly, but of course, that's humanly impossible. Um, so it, just keeping myself active, working, I think was more healing than if I had gone off somewhere and done nothing uh, except feel really bad. This yeah. is also a point where I think you become more um, apparent uh, about your activism inside the work as well. Well, I... I think, oddly enough, that the accident gave me my voice because I knew that I could be dead tomorrow. Any of us could be dead tomorrow. I mean, I'm flying home tonight. I hope we make it. You'll make it. We'll make it. You'll we'll make, make it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrified of flying. I have flown, I've flown a lot. I went to Rio one year um, to visit someone, and coming back, the engine was loose on the wing. And here we are flying over the Amazon desert, and the, it's like that. I've been on a plane that got hit by lightning. I, got, I was on a plane. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you traveled a lot. Yes. Even with that phobia, it's that really, fear of flying, you've traveled mm -hmm. a lot. And well, Garth has to probably <laughs> put me in a bag and put me on, in, <laughs> with the luggage. I mean, oh... I hate it. But anyway, that's what you, Frank and Thaler have in common, and Aretha Franklin. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Okay. Oh, very, nice, very nice. But uh, we were talking earlier, too, about the, and, and pulling up on the autobiographical series, mm -hmm. this notion of diary and using mm -hmm. postcards and photography mm -hmm. um, from your travels, which you started as early Absolutely. as 1973. Yeah. 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 It just, I mean, it, they, Right now, the pieces I'm doing are more abstract. I haven't included any images, although they are maybe quasi-abstract. Uh, like, there's a piece, Nautilus, I think that was up on the board there, um, 
where I'm looking at that swirl. In a way, yeah, all going back to nature, you know, and so forth. Although it's kind of funny, my, uh, here we are surrounded by ocean, and um, I literally, you know, I feel like anything I look at, there's like something weird that happened to me. I was in a student ship coming from uh, Europe, from France, to uh, New York, New York, New Jersey, in um, 1964. And I remember going to, I stayed in Paris for a while, then I went to Le Havre, and we hit a hurricane in the middle of the Atlantic. 125 mile an hour winds and 60 foot waves. Now, I mean really. <laughs> I mean, we moved in every possible direction at the same time. And I really am so grateful. I am grateful every moment of the day for the captain that we survived. So in my work, a number of times I use water as an image. And for me, it's both that awful trip. I saw no life jackets. And I saw no lifeboats. But it wouldn't have mattered anyway. 60-foot waves, you're dead, you know? Anyhow, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll... I went on a cruise with my father, and I would sit in front of the TV where they listed the wave height. And when it went above four feet, I was hysterical. But anyway, it's post-traumatic stress stuff. Um, <laughs> You're still here. It's really important. Still still yeah, there's a but reason why you're still here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Though someone tries to take you out, apparently. Um, you did also really an ama amazing work after this accident, Free White and 21, which is a standout work in art history, but it's also a standout work in your oeuvre because you moved to video right. well, straight out know, of the studio painting. What I do is I, I try to do the work in the media that I feel is appropriate. I have no technical background in video at all. And I just had this idea for the video of this constant like, talk between the white woman. It came out of my feminist stuff, too, uh, because uh, the white women, some of them, one in particular was telling me to just um, you know, back off of mentioning racism in the feminist movement. Um, so I, I play one part where I use um, stage makeup and I put on a blonde wig, and I have eyeglasses, sunglasses, literally from the 1950s. And so I talk to myself back and forth, and I talk about various things. And the uh, persona, which is um, in white face, says, you must be paranoid. You know, that never happened to me, but then I'm free white and 21. So it goes, the dialogue goes back and forth. At one point, I wrap my head, and I believe that's from the car accident, because I did have a head injury. One thing I wanted to add, it was kind of miraculous. A friend of mine um, got a Fulbright and was living in Germany, and she was very bored. So she knit this thick, thick, thick wool hat for me, and I was wearing it that day. And as a result, I'm sure I would have been dead. I would have had a cracked skull. Uh, it cushioned me uh, when we, you know, with the impact, yeah, yeah. Well, let's get back to some of the work you did mm -hmm. uh, in terms of activism. Mm -hmm. And um, you talk about traveling. Mm -hmm. Whenever oh, you want. Oh, yes. OK, we'll wrap that up. And, okay. uh, but you talk about activism, but how it manifests in the work is mm -hmm. very wonderful. We were talking earlier about your mm -hmm. travel to Japan. Yes. And um, the work you did, Hiroshima, mm -hmm. which oh, is yeah. quite stunning, that yes. comes on the hinges of your mm -hmm. autobiographical work. Yes. Well, um, I received, when the NEA was giving out grants to artists, um, I received, um, I was told that I could choose between Africa or Japan. And the museum had sent me to Japan the year before to courier some Monets. And the organization that was sponsoring the exhibition took me all over Japan. And it was near the anniversary of Hiroshima. Uh, they took me to Hiroshima to see a new museum that was opening in honor of those who had died. I had a moat around the museum which represented um, the river where people jumped in to cool off from the heat of the bomb and they were boiled, the, the water was boiling. Um, and of course the museum, I mean what you see, God forbid, I mean it's horrible. 
you know, with people with their skin hanging off and melted objects. And I mean, it, and it just haunted me. And I had to do, you know, this piece. I think it maybe has about 10 pieces to it. And it's like a lot of islands. Jap Japan um, is an island. And then I put various kind of deformities. At first it looks okay, but it's not. Um, it's now uh, owned by the National Academy. Um, when I was voted or elected to be in the Academy, I gave that, you give them a work of art. I gave them that as, as uh, my, they call it, diploma piece. Um, uh, but it was a kind of experience that haunted me. I had to do something And I think it shows it. a kind of pacifism that you've been mm -hmm. bringing up in your work again and yeah. again. Um, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone has one, please raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. Hello, uh, my name is Forrest. I'm an artist, art by Forrest. Um, louder. Uh, my, name is, my, name, my name is Forrest. I'm on Instagram, art by Forrest. Um, just inspirational uh, stuff. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to touch on one thing you had mentioned earlier when I first walked in. You were, were, talked about tox toxicity in the, um, the um, the paints and that kind of stuff, and you know, using a lot of oils and acrylics and all that kind of stuff. If you could just touch on um, just a little bit more about that, or anything sure. you know about toxicity in sure. the uh, paints and stuff. Okay, sure. I mean, I teach it, so um, I'll sort of summarize it because I know we're going to run uh, out of time. First of all, any of your oil-based paints with, I think, both oil and acrylic, you, acrylic, you have the issue of the different. Uh, like cadmiums affect your liver, all right? A lot of people don't let you know, but now they're forced to look at the back of the tube, and they are now forced to tell you if this, there is a particular toxicity. Lead white, they market it under a different name. So they don't say this is lead white. It's either crimnans white or flake white. So you have to be kind of savvy about how they mislead you. Also, there is a very extremely beautiful color. It looks like raspberry sherbet, and it's called cobalt violet. It is arsenic, okay? Now, what you could do, because there's probably even more, um, oh, watercolor is also toxic. Don't, you know, think that when you use watercolor, because it goes into your skin and into your bloodstream. I always give my students in my oil painting class uh, rubber gloves. I just go out and buy a big box from top Costco. And that way, you know, there isn't, because I'll see them like, you know, trying to paint with their fingers and I have to say, no, don't do that. Especially if you are devoted to this career, you need to protect yourself. And we really shouldn't even leave it up to the manufacturers to tell us because there are a lot of things they're not going to tell us about. Okay, so one approach would be to um, get online and uh, Google art hazards. There are a number of books. The ones that I have are maybe five or six years old because they, you know, discover new things all the time. But the key thing is I used to smoke and paint. I used to eat lunch and paint. I do not let my students do that. Right. We can't smoke on campus anyway, but I won't let them eat. Um, you, if you use your gloves to paint, then you can eat. But if you... Hmm? You smoke? No, no. No more smoking. I, uh, another I, question? I, 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 no. <laughs> no, I stopped smoking when I was your age. 30. We have a question in the back. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yeah, I'll use it. Just look for health hazards. Google health hazards art materials, okay? Because it's, it's, it's something that you need to have on hand. So I use, like, with you charcoal, you can inhale it. Wear a dust mask, okay? If you're working with oil in, a, in an area where you don't have much ventilation, they finally gave us really good ventilation in our painting rooms. Wear a fume a fume mask, and you know, technically you should have a fume hood, but who has a fume hood? Um, you know, try to have as much ventilation as possible and don't sleep in the same room. Just like you don't charge your cell phone in the room where you sleep, you do not sleep in the same room. 
dropping the knowledge. Okay, we're running out of time. <laughs> Question. <laughs> Howard true. Dina. Um, Lowry did a talk at uh, MoMA a couple of weeks ago, and it was based on the book that looked at the history of changing conditions for artists of color in the museum in the 1960s and 70s. She mentioned you as a very important force in that exchange. Do you want to, even though it's about more about your work, do you want to address your positioning at MoMA doing that sort of very heady moment? Well, tell you the truth, I was basically powerless at MoMA. I mean, I was dealing with, you know, like the head of CBS. I was dealing with the Rockefeller. I mean, you know, I was nothing. <laughs> How can I explain it? I had a zero influence except within my own department and the uh, final decision for what went up for acquisition came by way of our chairman, not any individual. We might actually, as a group of three or four in the department, like something, but if the chair didn't like it, that would be, you know, forget it. But it made me sensitive to how work is selected. For example, you might have um, someone come in with works by artists from Eastern Europe, and there would be interest in that work. And it may not be so great, the work. Or you would have foreign policy. Now, that's something that was interesting. At the modern, they, wherever foreign policy happened, there, the collectors would go there and buy up the art. Also, they were tied in, I think, with some aspect of the government because there were people that would come through where we would need to train them. Like I was training a young woman who was from Tehran during the Shah of Iran. And the person who had the same title that I had, um, she ended up being the Shah of Iran's curator. Uh, I ended up being interviewed by a South African newspaper, and then it turns out, in the museum, and then it turns out there was someone from South Africa who was in a position like, I don't even know why he was there. I didn't even know what his rank was. So there was this kind of um, government involvement, and so if we were in a certain part of the world, um, you know, for example, I remember I had lunch with one of the trustees, and her husband was Kinney Cut Copper. And so I just said to her, uh, how much are you paying, you know? The worker, she said, oh no, they'd have nothing without us. You know, so with this, this, you know, the kind of parasitic thing about taking another country's um, um, natural minerals, um, just, you know, their metals, their whatever. Um, and we have it also now in the, in the uh, Congo with coltan, which is in all of our electronic devices. Now, I'm not at the modern now, so I don't know if we are bringing in Congolese people to train. You know, and I shouldn't say we, past tense, mm -hmm. they. I don't know how involved they are in terms of uh, current politics or foreign uh, politics. Well, I should say, because we've alluded to it several times, that Howard Dino was the first curator of color at the Museum of Modern Art, well, as was... Keniston. 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 Um, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I no. stand corrected. Was I would say the first me. woman of color right. to be hired. So, I mean, as curators, you know, certainly Howard Dino and Laurie, uh, who was the first curator of color... Laurie uh, Stokes Sims. Yes, yeah, Stokes Sims, at uh, the Met. So we owe a great deal and debt of gratitude to the pioneering work that you've done, even though you felt mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of influence. The fact that you were there yeah. was highly influential. Well, I would run into funny things. This is uh, because people, again, assumed I had all this power, which I didn't. I know there was one artist of color, a woman, who said it was my fault that she wasn't collected by the museum. So I would get you know, these kind of snide right. remarks. Um, or because I was also showing my work, sometimes people just hated my work because, you know, I was not able to just pull the doors open and everyone come in. could come in. Um, you know, I mean, I just knew that I was learning. I was there to learn. And, uh, of course, I learned visually because I was surrounded. 
um, but just to learn about how the place functions, how to, how does the art bureaucracy function? Who is allowed to be on top? How many are uh, boards, interlocking boards do you have? For example, the husband's on the board of the Whitney, the wife is on the board, and then they're getting advanced information about shows, so they know what to buy in advance. So you get this kind of insider trading situation. Then there was one thing that I always, I mean, I always sort of am amused by it. When I first started there, there was a um, Frank Stella exhibition. Frank Stella's dealer, I can't remember his dealer's name, but uh, Larry Rubin, his, Larry Rubin's brother was head of painting and sculpture. So then while the brother was head of painting and sculpture, then, um, Bill, Bill Rubin, sorry, sorry. Um, then that meant that Stella got to do a show and Larry Rubin got to profit from it and then the trustees, the acquisition boards knew this was on the book so then they could go out and buy it, buy low, sell high, right. so to speak. It's so. a small and claustrophobic art world at well, times. Yeah. <laughs> no, the but more you, you know, the less you'll take it personally. Yeah, amen, amen, <laughs> amen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Howardina, you may not have had a great deal of power at moment, but you have a great deal of knowledge that you have passed on to us today. And so, as Val said, we owe you a debt of gratitude, not only for our careers, but we all owe you a debt of gratitude for your time and your wonderful stories today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.